hi everyone, I'm Olivia Georgia and I uh, work uh, with Mary Miss and Liza Kuko who is here this evening uh, at Cydia's Living Laboratory and it's really nice to see a lot of uh, familiar friendly uh, faces and some people that we uh, don't know at all. <laughs> so that's uh, uh, even better. And um, this is a, a, just a you know, in the spirit of full disclosure, this is the very first program that we've done on Zoom. Um, I've, I'm like many of you, I've, I've been on a lot of Zoom meetings, but this is the first time that we're um, hosting one ourselves. And, uh, and this is a very special uh, moment and a, a great celebration, a new project uh, that we're doing and we hope to uh, continue this in the future. Uh, so um, uh, I'm just gonna, you know, say a few things uh, uh, in terms of logistics. Uh, we ask that everybody keep their mic muted um, in case of uh, background noise that might interfere with the audio. And um, uh, and we we would like uh, to spend some time towards the end of the uh, discussion to invite questions. And I would like to suggest that you write them into the chat room um, so that we can perhaps run through it and see if there's duplicates and try to um, invite um, uh, you know different people uh, who might have similar um, uh, questions to pose. So. Uh, with all of that, um, I'd like to introduce Mary Miss, who is the founder um, of City is Living Laboratory and, uh, and a, a visionary artist who has been uh, deeply uh, interested in what's happening with um, the, the daylighting of Tibbetts Brook um, and, uh, and has been so happy to have uh, Nicholas and John contribute to our efforts uh, in the uh, northwest part of the uh, of the Bronx. So, um, so Mary, unmute your ma your mic and and join us. Uh, I really am so happy to have everybody here today. We had been trying to imagine how we could move forward with our spring programs and uh, all these interesting things we had been thinking about. And uh, Liza and Olivia and Valeria, everybody is pitched in and. Uh, tried to make something new for us possible. So we're really excited about this. So uh, welcome everybody to our first program. And uh, I look forward to being, listening in, being part of this. Um, Mary, can you tell everybody a little bit about Call Walks and what the this um, walk that we're releasing today is a part of, like from a bigger picture? Yeah, well, so, uh, I don't know, about a decade ago, I got interested in trying to think about how we could think of New York City and change the way the city would um, think about itself and how people would act in the city and came up with an idea of focusing on the corridor of Broadway. And instead of one artist coming up with an idea for that corridor, uh, what I really wanted to do was have as many different artists and designers meet and talk with uh, scientists and community members out on the street and explore the issues of, you know, about how we could start living differently in the city. And so we've done over 70 walks and they've really been interesting, all kinds of people uh, we looked at all kinds of issues because, as you can imagine, the issues along that corridor from the wealthiest, wealthiest neighborhoods of Manhattan to the poorest neighborhoods have so many different uh, things, whether it's storm surge down with, you know, in Battery Park City uh, and Tribeca, getting up to Harlem and talking about bad air and getting up to the Bronx and specifically focusing on the area around Van Cortlandt Park. Um, but one of the things that we've always regretted is that uh, these walks are over. We have brief videos, but we've had this idea recently of trying to make them accessible to people over a longer period of time. And uh, Eddie Gonzalez was really helpful in uh, starting uh, with us to look at the idea of doing a podcast. And we had this great walk with Nicholas, uh, and John Butler last spring, I think it was, I'm not sure. Uh, but 
it was uh, so interesting. We thought, okay, here's a first walk that we could uh, test as a podcast. Uh, so you've got the thing that I really love, two really different perspectives. Uh, John is an ecologist and has a way of looking at things in detail that I really appreciate. And Nicholas has this other way of kind of intimately examining the world, and in this case, the trees of the world. So what happens when you put these two together is, is what we found so compelling. But Liza here, in the, sitting quietly, is the mastermind behind all this. Maybe you want to say a few words, Liza. Um, yeah, I think that uh, ever since I, I think when I first started working for Call, it was in May. And so we always do walks um, in the springtime. Usually um, we do walks the first weekend of May as a part of Jane's walks. But that the year in 2017, I started working at Call. Um, we did our, we did um, spring walks in June. And uh, so from the Get go when I when I started at Call, um, I really saw the walks as a real primary part of what we were doing in communities because it was my first activity that I participated in, and I've been thinking about how we could um, make the content of our walks available to a bigger audience than just the people who turn up on the day, but in a way that isn't as um, as resource heavy on us as constantly leading walks all the time. Um, and so I, I was really excited that we could finally take forward this project of making these self-guided walks. Um, and I'm so excited for how, um, how making programs like this one that we're launching today um, can enable us to have uh, an in indefinite number of people connect with the um, that we're walking in our city, but also in some of the other cities that we've led walks in, in in Pittsburgh and Santa Fe and where some of our partners are. So we're really excited about this project and um, we're, we're, we're uh, putting together a walk that for Milwaukee right now, which um, is gonna be a, a self-guided walk. And we're just looking forward to seeing how this initiative might grow and expand. Um, so I'm really glad you're all here to celebrate that with us. And uh, I think, are we gonna head over to Nicholas and John? Yes, uh, I just wanted to say a, a few words um, about uh, Nicholas. Um, some of you uh, know his work, I'm sure, quite well, and others of you uh, may have never um, encountered it before, but uh, I, I've known and worked with Nicholas for uh, quite a few years. I won't admit how many, <laughs> so that will date both of us. Um, but uh, Nicholas has, uh, part of his practice has been doing processional work uh, for, for many, many years, um, walking as a way of, um, of connecting with people, with experiencing space, with, um, with ritual practice. And uh, it is both um, in a very serious and uh, sort of spiritual uh, um, uh, means for him and, uh, and that he hopes to connect with other people, but it's also with a, a spirit of levity and um, uh, and and uh, empathy, and so it was so perfect to invite Nicholas to um, do a walk with uh, with us in Van Cortlandt Park, and uh, and this uh, project was really to uh, help people uh, develop a greater sense of empathy for trees, and uh, and then beyond that. So, uh, and then John, uh, uh, Mary, who Mary mentioned, uh, is an ecologist. Uh, uh, was just such a wonderful partner, not only as an individual and uh, a scientist himself, but also um, because he is, uh, he represents in part um, uh, the Friends of Van Cortlandt Park and now the Park Van Cortlandt Park Alliance, um, which has been a, a very important partner of ours and has done an enormous amount of work on the advocacy for uh, daylighting tibets, which is uh, something that we hope this will energize uh, as uh, as we go forward. So, um, so let me turn it over to uh, Nicolas and John, and um, uh, please share with us your experience of putting this walk together and what you hope um, others will get out of uh, the experience of doing the walk on their own. Sure, thank you all. Um, so, uh, 
I guess I'll, I'll start, Nicholas, if that's, uh, if that's all right with you. I have I actually have uh, something that I was thinking about earlier that I would like to just share with everyone um, in terms of my experience. And then I, I've got a, a good question for you, hopefully, as well. Um, because when I was first asked to uh, lead this walk with uh, Nicholas, I was, I was very excited. Um, I normally, when I'm walking in the park, I, uh, or just out in nature, I generally, um, my mind wanders and runs a, a mile a minute. And so um, kind of like the, the way I end up talking to is I, um, I give a lot of tours in the park and uh, I tend to just shout out a lot of facts to people, which is what a lot of people like. Um, but what I found very refreshing um, when I did this walk with Nicholas is that um, is, is his way of, of actually uh, leading a walk. And it really was able to, uh, I was able to take a breather and take a step back and, um, and really uh, sink in a little bit more to uh, what was actually going on rather than thinking of all of the, uh, the ecological processes. But then I also work in the park. So a lot of times when I'm walking in the park, I also think of the, um, the things that need to be done uh, in the park that we need to do as, as workers. So, um, so I just thought it was very nice to take that and really slow down um, my process of, of walking and, uh, and giving a tour. Um, Nicholas, what was, what was your experience like for, for leading a, a... I'm looking at everyone's uh, faces. Um, thank you everyone for being here. I'll be answering your question in a second, uh, John. If everyone can hear me, just give a thumb up. Can you hear me okay? <clears throat> um, great. Uh, so I'll just take a few seconds to see everyone here. People I know from different places. I see uh, faces from New York City. I see faces from the Bronx. I see faces from uh, Albion, Michigan. Uh, welcome everyone and faces from other places as well. Um, first, I would like to thank the earth for, for everything it does for us, or she does for us. Um, can I take one second, John, to lead everyone through a very brief practice? Is that okay with you before I answer your question? Oh, certainly. Go for it. <laughs> so, whatever you are, just take a minute to pause. And you can keep your eyes open, just befriend the chair in which you're sitting. You know, I see people sitting on sofas, I see people sitting on stools. Um, I'm actually sitting on a chair that's not that comfortable, but it's, it's okay, it's great. It's all wood and I'm happy for it. So just befriend the chair where you're sitting. Um, allow your feet to get in contact with the earth. Some of us might be uh, 15 feet, 15 floor um, above the earth. Some of us might be uh, at ground level. It doesn't matter. So let's pay attention to gravity. And open up for feeling cared for. And this is a practice that I do every morning when I wake up and get up. I place my feet on the floor of my bedroom. And I allow myself to be held by the earth. Just that, I don't have to do anything else. So before I just go about my crazy day, I put my feet on the floor. I feel the contact between my feet and the earth. And I realize that I'm not floating, that I'm not going to fall, that I'm, I am being held by the earth. And that is such a great feeling. Whatever might be happening around me, whatever situation might be unfolding, I am being healed by the earth. So if we can uh, bask for maybe um, five to 10 seconds in that sensation of being healed by the earth. We're not falling, we're not tripping, we're being healed.
and maybe take a few deep breaths, breathing in very gently, whatever way you breathe, breathing in, without forcing any, anything and breathing out. Breathing in, and breathing out. And one last time, breathing in, and breathing out. So, answering your question, John, um, I was uh, very excited as well to be working with you. I know that we met a couple of times prior to the walk in Van Cortland Park. And um, we just, I, I, I mean, personally, I feel that we got along right away. And that I, I sensed your way of thinking. I sensed your love for the place, your passion for uh, Van Cortland Park. And if I can make a parenthesis here, when I first moved to the Bronx, to New York City, when I first moved to New York City, I was living in Manhattan. But the first job that I got was with, and I always forget, the Bronx River Restoration Project, which was led by Nancy Wallace. And many years have passed, and my understanding is that now the Bronx River Restoration Project is the Bronx River Alliance. Um, long story short, the first job that I got when I became um, a U.S. resident was in the Bronx. And we used to go to Van Cortland Park and take children there. We would take children from Fordham Road mainly and spend the days there, go to the swimming pool and leave walks. So to me, this was a homecoming. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it was, it was like coming back home to the Bronx, to the park, and to, uh, to all those memories I have of the place. Um, with that said, I have a question about you, and I know that Tibet's Brook is um, the main subject of a lot of what uh, Mary Mees does and um, what you do, John, and what Olivia and Liza um, do, what we all do as a team in many different ways. Not everybody here in this room is familiar with Tibet's Brook. Can you talk about it? What is Tibet's Brook? Sure, certainly. Um, yeah, I... I uh... So I usually spend a fair amount of my days in, in Tibbetts Brook. Um, it's a small freshwater stream uh, that runs through the park and starts in Yonkers, um, running into the Bronx and uh, has a small watershed of only about 3,000 acres total. Um, but this water body is, is, is really touching and really cool and, and shows a lot of remnants of what um, the past was like uh, in 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 the Bronx and and in this region. Um, it ends up that uh, that most of the water bodies throughout the city have been placed underground. A lot of the freshwater water bodies, and and um, we're lucky that Tibbetts Brook, most of it is still above ground. Um, the final maybe third of third of the length of the brook is, is actually put into the sewer system. Um, and this was actually done early in, in the early 1900s. Um, it was placed in the sewer system. Uh, and uh, the, the whole plan and, and idea and, and why um, we're, we're get to work together with um, City as a Living Lab is, is, um, is the idea to, to daylight the brook and bring it back above ground. Um, so the, the goal is really um, to promote awareness to people um, as well as do a lot of scientific work along the brook. So um, as well as, as, well as um, uh, management work too. So I do spend most of my days, um, especially during the summertime, I spend uh, five days a week in Van Cortland Lake, which is part of the brook, uh, clearing out an invasive water um, invasive aquatic plant um, but it's and then right now even though I'm I'm in my apartment um, I just finished up uh, putting inputting some data on uh, some some benthic invertebrates that were found in Tibbetts Brook that we're uh, trying to write a, a scientific paper on and, and have it published sometime this year so it's a really amazing freshwater body that uh, that often gets overlooked because a lot of 
what we would view is is underground, um, but it's still it's still there and still flowing. Uh, John, can you just for us um, people that are not as uh, well educated as you about uh, benthic invertebrates, e explain uh, what they are and why they are uh, an important indicator of the health of the water? Oh, sure. Uh, so the the uh, benthic invertebrate, um, an invertebrate is is just a, uh, something without a backbone, and um, benthic would mean that it's it's living in in the water in the the benthic zone, and so um, a lot of these of what we're dealing with are are macroinvertebrates that we look at, and so last year and all throughout 2019, while collecting uh, water quality data, we also collected um, samples of what the the aquatic life in Tibbetts Brook actually was um, at different points throughout the brook. And then those can actually tell us um, the, the health of the brook based on the number of species that we found. And um, some require healthier water quality than others. And so what we've ended up finding so far is, is um, we found 20 different, 25 different families of of um, benthic invertebrates, which is a surprisingly high amount um, for an urban area. So uh, it's, it's still flush with, with life. And um, I guess my whole goal, one of my large goals is, is really just to show the life of, that's living in Tibbetts Brook um, and show that off so that people get more excited about it. Um, in that way, so anyway, videos and pictures and getting people out into the into the water is is probably the best thing. Um, and that's why this this tour was great. Was it actually gave us a a chance to talk more about about this water body and and the watershed and and a lot of the trees that um, that surround Tibbetts Brook and and actually end up filtering and giving allowing for it to be such a, a healthy ecosystem. Thanks for that. Um, uh, I'd like to just add a, a, a sort of a little a note on uh, the larger context of um, what happens to Tibbetts after it, it uh, gets to Van Cortlandt Lake. Um, some of you may know and others may not, but um, uh, Tibbetts Brook um, is channeled into the Broadway sewer. It was buried in the sewer in the early uh, uh, 1900s and um, it takes, uh, when going into the Broadway sewer, um, it is uh, shipped off to Ward's Island. Um, and it's basically clean water that we are paying a lot of money to be purified uh, and then released back into the New York Harbor. Um, because that uh, the, the brook itself is, is so robust, uh, even with being a rather small watershed, um, about 50 or 60 million gallons, I think, a day uh, go into the Broadway sewer from Van Cortlandt Lake, which is an unfathomable amount of water. Um, and whenever it rains, uh, that uh, sewer overflows, and it overflows into the Harlem River, and it is the largest source of pollution um, in the Harlem River, and uh, of course, uh, fouls a lot of the waterways as a result. And so uh, the day daylighting um, project is uh, an effort to uh, help clean the waterways, but also by bringing the water to the surface to create a linear park um, that will have many other environmental benefits and um, uh, and also um, inhibit some of the uh, the flooding that happens in the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, and uh, makes it easier for people to access Van Cortlandt Lake, Van Cortlandt Park, uh, and potentially uh, a string of parks that will be, um, have been proposed at least uh, to be built along the Harlem River. So it's a, it's a very pivotal project on so many different levels. It is so wonderful to be talking about water. Um, I didn't know until uh, 2012 uh, when I went to a workshop and a class by um, Beth Stevens and Annie Sprinkle. And when I came out as an ecosexual, that I was an aquaphile. Uh, that's somebody who's really turned on by water. And they <laughs> I found that out by Annie because when I was growing up, and my mom would tell me that, I mean, she would tell me now that um, I would be in a little like baby's bath probably like a thin one, 
and I would be as happy as a clam. And when as she went to pull me out of the water, I would scream and I would like, I would be like, I would look purple from being so much in the water. My skin would be wrinkled, but I, have, I would have a fit um, if she pulled me out of the uh, little bathtub. And so I think that from, uh, from early on, I was attracted to water and to all of, these, uh, to all of its qualities. And so when uh, John and I and Olivia and Liza and Mary walked to Tibbetsbrook as part of uh, the walk that we were organizing, um, I was immediately attracted. I was immediately called by it. And um, with that in mind, I would like to ask John. I know, John, that I'm probably coming from a more uh, poetic, maybe, uh, maybe not, maybe more metaphysical point of view. But I see uh, rivers and lakes and what else, the, what else, the ocean and all kinds of bodies of water as having their own distinct voices. Uh, what is the voice of Tibet's Brook and what has it told you? Have you heard any stories from Tibet's Brook? Sure. Um, yeah, I know we, we spoke of this bit, um, especially during our, our walk too. Um, so what always comes to, to mind when I always think of, when I think of, um, of rivers having having voices is their just their their babbling sense, um, and that you'd be able to have um, here you could hear certainly hear a difference between um, something like Tibbetts Brook versus uh, a larger river like the Bronx River might give off a a, la a louder noise, um, but I think the the stories that it really tells are, are amazing. I. When I was um, in my undergrad, I actually uh, had to read a book for, for school called uh, Reading the Forested Landscape. And um, this book was, was amazing in that it, it had all of these illustrations of, um, of what old um, brick and stone walls would look like, or um, what if you found certain types of fencing, what that potentially would mean for, um, for the history of the forest there. And um, I think the same can be said, and maybe even to a larger extent, um, waterways. Because um, in Tibbetts Brook, when walking along the, the bottom of Tibbetts Brook, you end up sinking in, uh, your feet sink in as you walk. And um, especially if you walk into Van Cortland Lake, your legs sink in up to your, um, up to probably about my hips. Um, so some people would be a little bit deeper than that because um, I'm, I'm a bit tall, but uh, this tells a, a full story of what's happened in the past and shows um, all of the, the sediment buildup over time. And this is, this is intriguing and really interesting from an ecological standpoint um, in that it, um, it shows the urbanization that has happened in this water body because of such um, heavy development. The, when it rains, the, all the soil and the extra dirt that we've, um, that we've created, uh, the, the rain ends up bringing it into the, directly into our, our water bodies without having um, trees in the forest to be able to soak that sediment up. Um, and, this sedimentation has happened over time in, in Tibbetts Brook um, and in Van Cortland Lake in particular for uh, at least 300 years because the, the lake, uh, Tibbetts Brook was dammed and created into Van Cortland Lake in 1699. And that's when um, really the building um, and, and kind of the changing of the watershed uh, started. And then it really picked up during the 1900s. Um, all of this sedimentation then gets mixed in with smaller uh, stones and um, and then you end up seeing some some trash and things like that that end up telling the the story of what's going on uh, in the in the water body and um, I do find that that pretty interesting um, from that standpoint so yeah on my on my end I, I end up thinking a lot about um, about how the water's flowing, what the what the stream banks look like, and what the what the amount of the sediment um, 
is like. I think if if we were to start digging uh, in Tibbetts Brook, we might not be able to find those um, those original stones that, that the uh, that the natives spoke about uh, 400 plus years ago, and and why it's it's named or was technically originally named Mashalu um, was based on the the stones in the river or the stones in the river that the water um, ran over and these stones can't really be found anymore and so um, I think that's the that's an interesting story that can be told uh, by the river itself. Um, I remember the days when they you know way back I'm talking about 30 years ago um, when walking along bodies of water in the Bronx, one would find mattresses and refrigerators. And uh, the story uh, went that there were even dead bodies. And so much has changed. And um, because of the work that all of you and all of us are doing and everyone here in this virtual room is doing, from recycling to caring for plants and trees, uh, so much is evolving uh, in a positive way, although much more work has to be done. Um, I know, uh, John, uh, that we talked about uh, issues of uh, garbage, trash. Um, it really breaks my heart when I go to Tibet's book and I find uh, lunch boxes, empty lunch boxes by the water. Um, so we still have a lot of work to do. And uh, to me, I think it's work that must be done at maybe one person at a time. And um, and this is a lot of what Mary Miss is doing. And so one person at a time, small group at a time, a virtual room at a time. Um, do you have anything to say about it? I mean, I find myself, um, wherever I go, usually uh, grabbing a plastic bag. And of course, things have changed nowadays because of the virus. We don't want to touch things that we don't know who has touched them before. But the way I operate, the way I usually um, go about when, um, being or visiting uh, places like Van Cortland Park is usually like filling up a whole plastic bag with all of these cards that uh, or these cards that people leave behind. And um, I had to stop myself from being judgmental because it is a matter of um, becoming more conscious about our relationship with the planet, our relationship with water, with earth, with fire, with wind. Um, so many people have grown so detached from all of these that they just don't see it. So there's no even anyone to blame. It's a matter of, I don't want to use the word educating, but allowing people to fall in love again with the earth and all of it, all of her elements. And talking about that, this is a, a rescue plant. This is one of my babies. I, I have an um, indoor garden. This is one of my rescue plants. And I found her on 28th Street uh, uh, during a winter night. And it was all maimed. It was like all broken. So you can see some of the uh, history of this plant. It's all, it was burned by the coal. Some of the leaves were broken. And I brought it home together with two pots of fern. And she has been thriving here in the Bronx. So this, is, this shows us that when we care for the green, for the trees, for the water, they can come back. Um, anything that you might have to say about that, John, about garbage and trash and our relationship to these wonderful uh, beings, because I consider them beings. I think you... Um, you definitely touched upon what I think of a lot, um, which is often too, it's, it is very difficult for myself to not get upset and, um, angry at individuals for not throwing away trash, um, when, uh, when really the, the whole system that we have in place is, is a little difficult and makes it, makes it difficult for us to, um, to really make these changes and um, especially in our um, our parks uh, uh, since we're since we're talking about Van Corland Park um, we have a, a right now uh, we don't have the amount of staff that are normally out there removing trash or even picking up the the trash cans to be able to remove them um, 
and so this this process has been shaken up and so um I've noticed the the increase in the amount of trash around the park. Um, however, I don't think that this should really, I don't think that really should discourage anyone from wanting to um, to be outside and connect. And, and also uh, that's one of the big things that has really um, made it exciting for me to, to be here and, and working here is that um, I was living in Vermont before I came to New York City um, for this job, and it was extremely different. That um, in that I would have jobs where I in Vermont where I would not see a human, and um, it was beautiful and and gorgeous. But um, I think the it's it's just such a more fulfilling experience to be here and sort of. We, we talk about, I talk about it with my colleagues all the time is that we feel more that this is, is sort of the front line. This is where the people are and where we can make the most change in terms of, of making these places that we all are able to visit um, vibrant and exciting for people to go to and, and to visit. So I think, um, I, I mean, for me, just having people come to the park is, is really exciting. Um, because we're able to 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 have those people share in in our experiences of of taking care of these these amazing places, I could easily uh, go for and look for a job out in in the wilderness and and want to do something like that. Um, but I find this this a bit more exciting and more fulfilling because it has those challenges of that are met with um, with with other people and other humans. So. I want to be able to acknowledge people's questions. Um, we're gonna do that at the end. So Claudia and all of you who have been asking questions, um, just bear with us for a little bit. Um, I'm going to read a very brief poem. Uh, please bear with me as well, because um, I'm new to reading poetry. And this is something that has been happening as the virus has developed and has become a menace to many of us. So this is a, porous, this is a poem called Forest Walk by Christine O'Connell George. I'm practicing my I belong here, no twig snap, no leaf rustle, no branch crack, see all, know all, float like fog, like smoke, pine needle soft, forest walk. No one will know I'm coming, no one will know when I'm gone. And I thought that that was such a powerful poem because um, I was reading uh, Micah Mortali, who leads uh, nature walks and, and does like uh, yoga in nature. Although I do have to say that one of the uh, statements from Anna Halprin, the dancer and avant-garde uh, choreographer is we are not, what is it that she said, we're not, um, we're not part of nature. I think it's we are nature. We are nature. So we don't have to detach ourselves from trees and water and earth. Um, but one of the things that Micah Mortali talks about in his book is that when we enter a forest, when we enter a park or a similar space, um, and we're not aware of that, we tend to make such a big noise. So he compares that to almost like throwing a stone into a lake and you see the waves forming. When you really learn how to enter those spaces like parks and forests and the like, you enter them in such a way that you make very little noise and therefore you don't create that throwing a pebble in the lake effect and therefore the creatures and all of the elements in the place don't have to run away every time you step in. And so this poem talks about entering one of these spaces and also leaving one of those spaces without being noticed. So I would imagine that the author has learned that, that, uh, that process of being very, very quiet, very quiet with trees and water. Um, I do have a final question because I know that we want to open up the, uh, the room for, quest for uh, questions from those in the room. Um, I see so much of this uh, daylighting, which is, was new to me before I started to work with um, Olivia and Liza and 
Mary and, and you, uh, John, I, I asked myself, what is daylighting? I mean, I was curious about it and I went online and searched. So it's really bringing rivers back and bodies of water back to what they were or like um, unearthing them. Those bodies of water that had been buried underground, especially in places like New York City. And I think I said that during the walk, but to me, this is more like a coming out of the closet type of thing, where the river is coming out of the closet, where bodies of water like David Brook is coming out of the closet. And there's so much out of the closet um, happening these days uh, in a good way. So can you talk about that? Uh, and perhaps, uh, I don't know if I should refer to Tibet Brook as, and, and the daylighting as a queer, um, queer undertaking in an ecological way. So maybe this is a, a queer eco-activism or eco-compassion. I don't know how I will define it or even if I want to define it, but this is really a coming out type of thing. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if we can, uh, we can really decide for Tibet Brook what, uh, what, what, how that, how it feels. Um, but I, I do think, um, I do think that the brook itself would appreciate us giving it, lending a hand and helping it out of, out of that closet and out from under the ground. Um, yeah, that's a, it's, it's, it's a good question. I just think that, um, the benefits of bringing this body of water out of the ground just completely outweigh um, us sitting around and letting it, uh, letting the water flow right into the sewer system. Um, due to not only that we are going to uh, decrease the amount of, of water that's, um, that's being put into our sewer system and then into the, um, into the, the rivers when it's, um, when it when the water level is high, um, as as well as sewage, but um, also just being able to have that water back in the community, um, the the Kingsbridge community uh, that's just south of of Van Cortlandt Park, um, that's where Tibbetts Brook used to flow, and uh, you can still see the remnants of the water body um, on streets like uh, Corlear and, and Tibet Ave, uh, where the, where the uh, houses themselves are dropped down from off the side of the, the road because of the amount of fill that has been placed on the road uh, in order to build it up so that there wasn't as much flooding. Um, so I think just having, having a water body back in that community um, for, and more parkland for people to be able to go and, and retreat um, is something that people need and, and is really helpful, especially during times like these. Um, it's, it's a, it would be a great benefit for the, for the community. I'm not sure if that answers your, your question. Um, but yeah, and then I had one quick question that I know you and I had spoke about for you, um, Nicholas, in that uh, now where do you, um, where do you see your your art and your work um, going in the future after um, after this? Is there is there any um, any things you you want to highlight and and places you want to go visit? Um, is there anything you'd be able to talk about on that front? Just very briefly, because I know that uh, we want to honor um, the time we have. Uh, agreed to meet here and because I want to hear and there's all there's a few questions from uh, people already in the chat room um, I see myself as but that's a great question John I see myself as an artist making less and less objects and concentrating more and more on experiences and uh, this will not be the we won't have the time to go about what I did in Albion in detail but um, Albion is an amazing town in Michigan and I moved there um, last year for two months, maybe two and a half months, with the intention of hearing what people in the Midwest have to say. And we have so many preconceptions about places. Um, so coming from New York and moving to Avion, I encountered myself in this amazing place, this like wonderland. Everything is not perfect there, like it's not perfect anywhere else. And engaging with people in conversations, cooking with people, uh, walking, 
and doing a lot of things outdoors. So that's the kind of work that I envision doing. Uh, it's it's a kind of work almost, it's work without works. Um, and with that said, I do respect the work that painters and people who draw and I totally value that are doing. And I think that some of those objects are really necessary to draw us into back into the earth and into loving uh, our planet. Uh, but personally, I see myself like retreating from making and entering more into the realm of ritual and experience and healing. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but as I say, I want to make sure that people can ask uh, their own questions. And I know that Claudia has one, but I'll let uh, Liza and Olivia uh, call people maybe. Could I just say something? It's so nice to listen to both of you talk. Um, you know, I've been obsessing uh, about this daylighting of Tibbetts Brook uh, for some time now. And you two are bringing the kinds of um, observations that I would love to be imagining available to more people. So it's going to take a long time for the uh, Brooke to actually get out of the sewer and into this new corridor that could be its home. And I want to keep people uh, imagining, dreaming of this uh, in the future. And you know, there are all these bridges that, seven bridges that cross that corridor. You can look down and see where the uh, stream could be. But I would love to imagine uh, Nicholas, that people could stand on that bridge and hear some of your reflections about uh, that that stream, what it what it is, what it could be, what it has been, and then at the same time, I'd love them to be able to have this kind of intimate detailing of uh, what could be living there, uh, John, that other side. So I just uh, you're bringing my fantasies closer to. Uh, to home, to roosting. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I, I think Rob, Robin, do you want to um, ask your question? Because considering that today is Earth Day, I think um, your question sort of brings us around to thinking about that. Um, that's uh, Robin uh, Brentano. Sure, yeah. So I'm really sorry that I missed the walk that the two of you did. Um, I understand, Nicholas, that uh, the essence of your work is really helping people connect in a very intimate way with the natural environment. And that on the walk that you did for Call, it was around, uh, the focus was on trees. But I'm just wondering how you help people connect their direct experience with nature on the ground with the planetary scale of climate change. Because it's a, it's, a, it's a very abstract thing, I think, for many people. And as an artist, um, I just wonder what, how, how you think about helping people make that connection. John, do you want to answer that question? Or do you want to go back and forth? So how to make people make that connection? Yeah. Um, well, I think it was, I think it was more focused on, on you and, and the art of it. Um, because mine, mine's a little more straightforward and we can talk about the facts of, of climate change, but I think, I think your, your art has more of like a, an interesting tactic in terms of how to, how to connect people. Um, so I would, I would revert okay. to you on that one. So I'm so, I have become so interested in uh, somatics and somatic movement. And I feel that, um, you know, talking about artworks and um, relinquishing um, this idea of making things with all the respect that I have for people who do. Uh, John and I were talking about, uh, and I was saying that um, I imagine sitting uh, right in front of Tibet's Brook as an unfolding painting as if we're watching a painting that's being, um, that's happening uh, and, and unfolding as you're looking at it. And um, I also see the, the whole thing as a dance, as a cosmic dance, uh, which I think is actually the name that um, Matthew Fox 
who is a um, writer and also who was a priest and who, um, long story, long story, but he creates these uh, cosmic masses. And, uh, but I see this as a cosmic dance. And I think that Claudia had a similar question um, about how do we create this uh, planetary connection? Um, I will have to refer to uh, what happened again and her planetary dance. And, and, and how we are nature. And maybe this is something that when we're thinking about connecting with um, the world outside, uh, we must also think that that world that we see as being outside is inside of us, in our bones, in our tissues, in our cells. There's not so much of a difference. I feel that that difference is really here in our minds. And that detachment has happened, of course, through the centuries. But if we put the two together, um, that the inside and the outside are one in many different ways. I mean, if we think about it from an ecological perspective, and if we um, focus on what's happening with plastic and how people, for example, throw things by Tibet Sprook, not knowing that the creatures that interact with the, this body of water, some of them are going to eventually be consuming this plastic and that the plastic is going to come back to us. So it's a matter, I think, of uh, attaining consciousness in, 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 and realizing that there's no really inside and outside that is all one, and that, that we are actually changing one another uh, in ways that it's probably very difficult for us to see at a tangible level. Mm -hmm. So we are changing, obviously, we are changing our environment, maybe a lot of the time not for good, but how can we create those changes uh, for positive outcomes? And this is what we're trying to do here. Um, I, I've seen a, quite a few questions about the sort of more practical or like um, design related issues to Tibbetts Brook. Um, we will send uh, in a follow-up email. Um, we'll note down some of these questions that people have asked because I'm looking and we've got seven minutes left to our, our meeting. And so I think the answers to those questions about who's involved with the design and what could it be, um, I think we'll um, keep you in the loop and uh, we can follow up um, to some of those questions in an email um, afterwards. Um, I wonder if we want to reflect though on the question that Zach uh, offered about ritual and practice. Um, would you like to? Yeah, add? I can. I can um, ask it again. I just, you know, thinking about um, Nicolas, you, um, you know, you're you're kind of waking up in the morning ritual, and you're uh, taking a plastic bag to um, pick up trash kind of how you uh, think about um, like what are, you know, uh, patterns of activity versus practice versus ritual and, um, you know, where, where um, intention is, where uh, kind of uh, artistic um, sentiment is, where connection with the, the earth is in all of those do, are there is there a difference between those um, three words for you pattern and practice and and ritual do you you know is uh, is picking up trash a, a ritual for you how do you think about those things it has become a ritual I just have to make sure that it does thin I mean uh, yeah, yeah, it has become a ritual for me. So wherever I go, and I, you know, I have to um, make sure that I don't go overboard. So I tell myself, to, um, and I have told myself, um, if I pick up two pieces of garbage every day, that's enough. I mean, I cannot collect all the garbage that I see on the sidewalk. And it really breaks my heart to see plastic bottles and all that. But I could be, that could become my full-time job. <laughs> um, so I had to redirect myself and say, Two pieces is good. If you can pick up three, that's great. And I try to do that. I haven't been doing that now because I'm cloistered at home. But when I go out, I, I do that every day, every day. And I'm thinking, wow, what if everyone in the world 
work to pick up two plastic bottles from the sidewalk, just two, or two caps from bottles, or two um, candy wrappers. Can you imagine the tons, the you know, the tons and tons of garbage that would not make it to the water? Just that. So that's a ritual that I do. And uh, maybe moving further into your question, I'm thinking about a conversation that Matthew Fox had with uh, Rupert Sheldrake, and uh, you know they're talking metaphysics and, and all of that and theology. And one of the questions that um, emerges is, do animals or uh, non-human animals, do they praise? And I thought that that was such a question. Do animals praise? And I think they do, perhaps not in the same way that we do, but just to look at a bird uh, engaging with a tree or to look at the raccoon at uh, Van Cortland Park engaging with the elements, I think that they do praise. What they praise or who they praise, I can't really tell you. But they might be praising this amazing being that is the earth. I mean, they are totally aware of it in ways that we're not, or many of us are not. And um, just very briefly, um, I was uh, listening to Larry Ward, who is an African-American meditator, and he raised such an interesting point uh, yesterday when he said that, uh, he says something, I don't want to misquote him, but he says something that what's happening now is that we're not engaging, we're not envisioning new ideas. And I do have to say that people like Mary Meese and Anna Halpin and Beth uh, Stevens and Annie Sprinkle and Olivia and Liza and John and all of you, we are here engaging in new ideas. But he was saying that the problem with um, a lot of the things that we're facing from politics to health issues is that we are engaging the same way of thinking the same ideas and patterns, pretty much like in a very tired and outdated ritual. We have to create new rituals, whatever they are, and they mean to each one of us. They don't have to be rituals prescribed by the institution. So I will leave you with the question, what are your rituals? And what are rituals that you think that can benefit you in relationship to the planet? We have to engage new ideas. And that applies to everything that I've said, from politics to health to uh, the ecology. We're basically um, blending and blending and bad, I don't know what's the word, like the same old higher ideas. So I thank Mary Meese and all of you for engaging here and, and thinking in ways that um, may be out of the box and out in the world, in the forest. Thank you, um, Nicolás. Yeah. Nicolás, that was a beautiful way of, um, of closing the discussion out. Um, and there were many other questions. I was really hoping a number, a number of them would um, find their way uh, to the conversation, but we will have to um, find another opportunity. And before we close, I would like um, Liza to talk a little bit about some of the upcoming events that are happening. And uh, I think this is, this conversation has been enormous food for thought, um, not least of which the final provocation, uh, uh, Nicholas, that you have, uh, have uh, given us. And so, Liza, um, tell us the, the next few uh, programs that we have on the on the board. Um, yeah, thank you, Olivia. Um, well, uh, first and foremost is that uh, it's okay if you didn't attend this walk in <laughs> last May, because um, the uh, self-guided audio tour is now available. Um, I will send a link to everyone um, uh, who has been at this event to download um, or to, to download the um, podcast. It can be you can get it on. Um, on uh, Spotify um, now, and it'll soon it'll should be available on Apple Podcasts and other things like that. Um, there a bit of uh, technical detail. This being our first one that we've done, um, there are definitely ways that we can logistically improve it for the future. Um, there is in the when you go to download or to listen to the podcast, if you click on the information for the podcast, it'll give you a link to a Google map that you can use to follow along while you're listening if you go into do it in Van Cortland Park.
That's can right. I say something quickly? Yeah. Um, yes. yes. I want to invite everyone. I don't know if you can see my lamp in the back, but there's, I thought about like a red, red uh, what is it, red district. So this is actually a green district. <laughs> if you can see the light bulb in the lamp, but I found that in yeah. my <laughs> let's, let's go green. So, um, I want to invite, um, first of all, I want to thank everyone here, and I want to thank um, three people. Anne, who um, I don't think she's in the room any longer. Um, Dr. Gerbar and Dr. Brown, who are my uh, breathwork teachers. And breathing has been a way for me, for some of those who had questions, breathing has been a way for me to relate with trees and waters and earth and all of that. So I thank them for their teachings and their wisdoms. But when you leave this room, maybe commune with something green. I have a piece of aloe here. For those of you who see that in the street being sold, and you're like, what in the hell is that? Well, that's an aloe. That's a piece of aloe. That's an, I don't think it's a leaf, but it's an aloe. I don't know, spike or I don't know what, how it's called. So it's really great for skin burns and, uh, and for other things that I won't get in detail um, here, um, such as uh, stomach problems and, and on and on and on, and for really young and beautiful skin. So go and commune with something green. Maybe eat something green or drink something green. Thank you all. This was a wonderful, wonderful kickoff uh, and uh, a, a really stimulating conversation. And uh, we hope we'll gather with you all again sometime soon. Take care. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all. Thank you.